Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video, we're going to preview game week six. I asked for your questions over on Twitter and on YouTube and you told me what your dilemmas are and the things that you wanted me to discuss ahead of the game week six deadline. We have got so much to cover in this video. I've tried to choose as many of your topics as possible. If you are enjoying the content on this channel, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe for more FPL content. But without further ado, let's get into today's video. So guys, don't worry, I am still here just for this first section, for this first discussion point. I have removed the camera just so that you can see the entirety of the graphic. I couldn't quite fit it on the screen and also have my camera, but I'll be back in the next few minutes for the next section. One of the most popular questions we had were around best budget midfielders and who are the best five midfielders that we should include on wildcard and are there any long-term budget midfielders that we can have or should we instead have a premium defense so there are a lot of questions around these sort of cheaper midfielders that would enable us to go to a premium defense and also potentially have two or three premiums in our team so what i did is i went through all of the different options i looked at the underlying statistics and the fixtures and these are the nine best budget midfielders in my options in my opinion for a number of reasons as you can see We've got three different underlying statistics for each of them. And again, you want to look at more than just three underlying statistics. But this is just, obviously, there's only so much you can fit on the screen. So the three I've gone for is expected FPL points per 90 in the first five game weeks. So this incorporates basically every metric. And lets you, this is from Fantasy Football Fix. And it lets you know how many points that the algorithm thinks that person should have scored per 90 based on the underlying statistics. We've also got expected goals plus expected assists, which is basically expected goal involvement per 90. And touches in the box, which is normally indicative of a midfielder that is going to have quite high goal threat and get into a lot of good opportunities. The other thing we've got is I've got the next five fixtures and we're using just the FDR colors from the main official FPL site. And then we've just got a Raptor rank. So this is basically combining everything, eye test statistics, fixtures, how nailed the player is, where I would rank these budget midfielders. So as you can see, there are nine options here. I think personally the best option is still Rafinha for a number of reasons. Now, I'm recording this at a time when I don't know if Rafinha is definitely fit, but I'm assuming that he is going to be fit for this weekend. I think his underlying statistics have always been fairly consistent. He gets a lot of touches in the box considering he plays quite wide. I know expected goals plus expected assists of 0.41 per 90 isn't absolutely overwhelming, but it's still very good. And it's the fixtures which are so appealing for leads over the next five. And they do continue a little bit beyond this as well. So for me, if you don't own Rafinha, just based off how we know he can perform, he's on a lot of set pieces as well. The fixtures are brilliant. I would be going for Rafinha. I think the next two options, it's quite difficult to choose out of second and third for myself. As you can see, I've currently got second as Connor Gallagher. Now, what I would say about Gallagher is it is largely dependent when you're playing your wild card. If you plan on playing your wild card in game week seven or game week eight, I don't think Gallagher's the best option because I think Brighton, Leicester and Arsenal in the next three aren't necessarily the easiest fixture in the world. I wouldn't be surprised if he did manage to get some FPL returns, but I don't necessarily think this is the time to bring him in if you're going to wildcard in a few weeks. However, if you've already wildcarded or you're planning on holding off your wildcard until game week 12 or game week 15, I think Gallagher's probably the best midfield option you can choose. You can see by his underlying statistics... He is top out of all nine players for expected FPL points per 90 and expected goal involvement per 90. And he's also quite high, high up for touches in the box considering the fact that he is a number eight. A lot of these other players are, are like wide wingers playing as part of a front, front three. Conor Gallagher's playing that number eight box-to-box -box role. So to get 4.25 touches in the box per 90 is very, very impressive. So Conor Gallagher is high on my radar. And as someone that is looking to wildcard around game week eight or game week nine, I'm almost certain Conor Gallagher will be in my team. So definitely worth keeping an eye on. But again, it does depend when you're wildcarding. I still don't think it's too late to bring in Ben Rama. The next five fixtures are all quite nice for West Ham. And I do think he is nailed in the Prem. I think he's more likely to be rotated in the Europa League. And again, look at, look at his underlying statistics. They are very strong. So for me, the best three options, if I were on wildcard this week, I would probably be going with Rafinha, Ben Rama and Gallagher. And again, it's completely up to you if you want to wait a bit for Gallagher. Perhaps you want to bring him in in three or four weeks when the fixtures start to really turn for them. But they would be my top three choices. Outside of that, some really interesting options. I've spoken about him in a few videos now El Yanusi at 0.1% ownership is a fantastic option I've spoken um, Lucy Heiner if you know her on Twitter the Southampton fan she said that he's not 100% nailed because when Walcott and Armstrong are back that's Stuart Armstrong the midfielder El Yanusi might not be completely nailed but for the time being
in he is. He's played 90 minutes in the last two or three game weeks. His underlying statistics are great. And from game week eight onwards, Southampton's fixtures are really, really good, which is one of the reasons I'm looking at bringing in Adam Armstrong this week. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. So I like the look of El Yanusi as a mega differential. Again, if you're looking for someone with long-term fixtures, Saka's another really interesting option as well, long-term. Again, I think Arsenal starting to improve now. He looks like he should be fairly nailed or as nailed as you can be in that Arsenal front three. So I really like the look of him as well. I know a lot of people will be interested in Ismail Saar. I think if you're going to bring in Saar, it has to be this week for the Newcastle fixture. After that, they've got Leeds, Liverpool, Everton, Southampton. They're not bad fixtures as a bunch, but I think you've really got to target this Newcastle fixture this week. So I do really like Saar as an option. As you can see, he's fourth on my ranking, but I would really be bringing him in this week. Otherwise, you've probably missed the boat on that. Traore, obviously his underlying statistics are quite strong, but he's just not delivering. So I've currently got him seventh on my list. And then I've got the two Everton boys at eighth and ninth. I just don't really fancy Everton at the moment. And the underlying statistics for Ducore and Gray are pretty poor. So I'm not really that keen on them. That being said, Norwich at home this week is the best fixture in the Premier League. So if you're going to bring in Gray or Ducore and you still like them, I'd probably do it this week. So that's a quick look. Again, it's not really been quick, it's over five minutes, but that's a quick look at the budget midfielders, the best budget midfielders in my opinion. As I said, I would be going for Ben Rama, Rafinha and Gallagher as three of my budget options on wildcard this week. And I'm back. So for this next section, a lot of the questions were revolving around Luke Shaw. How long do we continue to hold him in the hope that he gets some attacking returns and clean sheets? Should we be moving on to Chelsea defenders this week? So in my personal opinion, what I'm doing with Luke Shaw is I'm definitely keeping him for this week. I think the fixture against Aston Villa at home is a pretty nice one. Villa have started to look a little bit better in the 3-5-2, but because Axel Twanzaby is an unavailable, I think they could revert to a back four or potentially they play like Courtney House in there, but it might not be as fluid as they were in the past. So I think a clean sheet is definitely possible. And again, attacking returns is always possible with Luke Shaw. So I'll probably keep him this week. And my plan is to move him on to a Chelsea defender next week. That being said, I think Everton and Leicester in seven and eight are definitely fixtures you could keep him. So if you're wildcarding in eight and you're not sure you want to go for a Chelsea defender straight away and you want to use your transfers elsewhere, I think you could keep him for seven and eight potentially. But by the time game week nine swings around, I really would be looking to move Luke Shaw on. I just think in particular, the Chelsea defenders have just got such a high chance for clean sheet in their fixtures that it almost seems a little bit too passive to just hold on to Luke Shaw. Underlying statistics wise, he's always been really, really strong. You can see his projected points is quite low for the next six game weeks. And the main reason for that is the fixtures just aren't great. But non-penalty expected goals and expected assists per 90 of 0.24 is so strong for a fullback. It's not quite the levels of like Trent Alexander-Arnold, but in a, in a system where he's playing in a fullback rather than like a three-back, he's not, he's not playing wing-back, he's playing fullback. He still gets forward an awful lot. And you can see by his touch map, it's almost perfect for a, for a left-back. He's taking all the corners for Manchester United. He gets in a lot of key passes and crosses, which always puts him high up in the bonus points. And the only thing really missing from his game is he doesn't seem to get into the box a lot. He makes a lot of overlapping runs, but he very very rarely makes inverted runs. But in my opinion, Luke Shaw is absolutely fine to keep for next week. I think he's absolutely fine to keep for game week seven and eight as well. But in my personal situation, I'll probably be moving him on to a Chelsea defender next week. So let's look at the Chelsea defenders. A lot of the other questions this week are around which Chelsea defenders should we pick, if any, how many of them should we pick and, and when should we be looking to bring them in? I'll try and make this as succinct as possible because there's so much we could say around this. Obviously, I think it's pretty well known now that the decision you've got is Alonso and James have the highest upside. They're more likely to get those attacking returns. However, they're far less nailed than the likes of Rudiger and Mendy in goal. Rudiger is the most nailed centre-back, but has very low goal threat, despite scoring uh, in game week five. And Christensen's probably even less nailed than Rudiger, around a similar sort of goal threat. But the fact that he's less nailed makes it a bit of an issue. But he is five million, so it does save you some money as well. You obviously also have the likes of Thiago Silva, etc. But for me, these are the four that I would be choosing from. In my personal opinion, if you're going to choose one Chelsea defender, I think you go for Rudiger. Now, the reason I say that is a lot of people from game week seven onwards are going to have at least, I think almost everyone in the game is going to have one Chelsea defender from game week seven. And I think a lot of the elite managers, those wildcarding in particular, will probably be on double Chelsea defense. Now, I want to explain why then I think Rudiger's the one if you go for one Chelsea defender. Say you choose Rhys James in game week seven, you bring in Rhys James into your team as the only Chelsea defender and a lot of other managers will be on the Alonso and Rudiger double up. If you are incorrect and Rhys James, because he's rotation proof, misses game week seven and game week eight and Alonso and Rudiger start both of those, 
you're going to be in real trouble there because a lot of other managers are going to have double Chelsea defence for two game weeks where you've only got one and he's been rotated. And especially with the likes of Reese James, they are prone to one minute ro like subs at the end of the game where you're going to get like one point. So you could really be missing out. You could be looking at sort of like 20, 30 point swings there. So for me, just to be as safe as possible, if I was going for one Chelsea defender, just to make sure I always cover that clean sheet. Again, Rudiger can be rotated, but it's much less often. I would be going for Rudiger. If I was choosing two Chelsea defenders, I would go for one, I would go for Rudiger and then one of Alonso or James. So for me next week, I will be taking out Luke Shaw and Luke Ayling probably and bringing in Rudiger and one of Alonso or James. In that way, I'm covering the clean sheet most weeks with Rudiger, but then I've also got that high upside with a bit of rotation risk in Alonso or James. Now, I think if you're choosing between Alonso and James, it's quite a tricky one. Alonso looks the more nailed for the time being. Chilwell has had a really tough start to the season, some stuff going on in his personal life. He's struggling to get up to fitness as well. The issues he had at the Euros as well was obviously quite harsh on him just sitting on the bench. So I think Tuchel's admitted that Chilwell struggled at the start of the season. So I think Alonso's probably nailed for like game week six, maybe game week seven, potentially game week eight as well. I just think long term, Chilwell is much harder competition for Alonso than the likes of Hudson Adoy or as Pilaqueta at right wing back is for Reese James. I think Azpilicueta is a much better right centre back and Hudson Adoy just isn't a right wing back, even though he can play there. So I think long term, James is actually more nailed than Alonso. It's just when that transition takes place. When is James going to start nailing his position down in the starting 11? And when is Alonso going to start seeing higher rotation with Chilwell? Is it when the Champions League starts to really kick in? Who knows? It might be that Chilwell's played in the Champions League. So it's not an easy thing to discuss. But that is my personal opinion on it. If you're choosing one, it should be Rudiger. If you're choosing two, it should be Rudiger plus one of James or Alonso. You could just go absolutely all out and have Alonso and James. I just think for me, again, I just want to be sure that I'm getting that clean sheet each week. And I think Rudiger will start 90, 95% of games. Christensen is a decent option. I just think he's got similar to goal threat to Rudiger, but much lower expected minutes. He's got Thiago Silva and Chalaba to compete with. So for me... And as Bell Equator as well. For me, I would rather pay the extra 0.6 million for Rudiger, but that's just my personal opinion. I don't think you need to bring them in this week, although they could keep clean shit against Chelsea, uh, against Man City. I think game week seven is the week to do it. But if you can't bring in Chelsea defenders next week because you don't have the free transfers, you can wait till game week eight. They might keep a clean sheet against Southampton at home, but missing out on one week is not the end of the world. And I think a lot of people will be wildcarding in game week eight as well as seven. So don't worry too much if you can't bring them in next week. But by game week eight, I personally think double Chelsea defence will be the way forward. And for me, I'm currently leaning towards that being Rudiger and Reese James. So combining the discussion around Luke Shaw, around Chelsea defence, around premium defenders, also in with a, a few questions I got about can you show us a wildcard draft for this week or for upcoming weeks. I've built that all together and I've presented here a premium defense wildcard draft. And this is a bit of a discussion around should we be moving funds away from our midfield and attack into the defenders because the defenders are getting those consistent returns. We can probably rely on the premium defenses to keep clean sheets. And there aren't that many emerging cheap options up top and in midfield that are returning consistently. And I think the answer to that might just be yes. At the moment, if I was to wildcard, I would be investing quite a bit of money in my defense for that reason. The fixtures coming up for City and Chelsea are really nice. Trent is obviously so impressive so far averaging 8.5 points per game so he's someone that I would want to keep as well and like I said those players in that midfield spot sort of Damari Gray is my Lassar they're performing but they're just not performing at the rate of the defenders and they're less consistent and up front, we've got so many injuries and so many potential issues and teams not clicking and Europa League and Champions League coming into play I do think there is definitely justification to have a premium defense going forward. So this is the draft I've built. It would be a 4-4-2 or a 4-3-3, depending on the week. What you would do in this draft is you would rotate Dennis and Gallagher. So I, I haven't checked the rotation, definitely that it works perfectly, but you would rotate a, your cheap strike with your cheap midfielder, depending on the week. In that way, you've got a really strong first sub and it also allows you to be pretty flexible. You could also play a 3-4-3 some weeks if you wanted to drop Cancelo or Rudiger. And I think some weeks... You, you might end up doing that anyway. With Cancelo and Alonso as potential rotation risks, I think you might have that issue anyway some weeks. The reason I've built this draft, again, don't focus too much on the players. It's more on the general structure. You've got four premium defenders, double Chelsea defense, Cancelo and Trent, and you've got Livramento as a great sub for the bench. You've got Alan, or you can go Suzoko as a 4.5, 4.6 million pound player midfielder. The reason I like this midfield four is you've got four very different price points. You can cover most transfers. You've got Salah, 
So you can go to De Bruyne, Bruno, whoever you want. You've got Rafinha around that 6.5 million. You've got a cheap midfielder in Conor Gallagher, who I think is probably, as we've spoken about already, the best long-term option. And then the reason I've gone for Grealish, again, don't focus on it being Grealish. It's just so that you can cover the Greenwood, Jota, Grealish, go up to Havertz, go down to Mount. You've got that price point where you can cover that sort of mid-price midfielder. And I think it's so important when you're on a wild card to be as flexible as possible. If you went from Grealish down to Saar and upgraded your forward, you might find it a little bit more difficult to get to a mid-price midfielder who might start emerging quite soon. And I do think Grealish is probably arguably the best City midfielder to have. He just looks so nailed in that pep side. So, And then the front three, Antonio and Ronaldo, I'd go for a premium striker and a mid-priced striker. And then Dennis, again, you can rotate with Gallagher. If you could get Dennis up to the likes of Armstrong or Pukki, that might be a better option. But this is just to show, yes, I think it might be worth downgrading some of your attackers and investing in your defense because that defense could score you so many points over the coming weeks and they're just so reliable and so consistent. So the answer to your questions regarding that is yes, I think so. And for me, this is roughly what my wildcard would look like if I was building a premium defense wildcard. Another really common question was what should we be doing with our Wolves players? I think a lot of people that played their wildcard around game week three or game week four would have brought in Wolves players. And I know a lot of people use their free transfers to bring them in as well. So I think most people will at least one Wolves player and they continue to disappoint. The underlying statistics continue to look pretty decent, but there's only so long that you can keep saying the underlying statistics look great if they're not delivering on that. So I understand the frustration completely. My question on this would be, why did you bring in Wolves players to start with? Just think about that. What was the reasoning? Was it because their underlying statistics look good and the fixtures look great coming up? If so, what's changed that's now made you think, well, you know, I'm done with the underlying statistics. I don't think the fixtures look that great potentially because for me, their underlying statistics are still pretty decent and the fixtures are still pretty decent coming up. So I think surely you've got to keep faith in those players, really, for me anyway. I think it does depend on the player that you're looking at. So for me, Semedo and Marcel, you've got to keep those. I don't think there's enough options at that price point or enough good alternatives to warrant taking out the defenders. You've got great fixtures in Southampton, Newcastle, even Villa and Leeds, Everton, Palace, West Ham, Norwich. Like All of those fixtures are potential clean sheets there for me. And Semedo and Marcel do continue to bomb forward quite well. So... I think if you own either of them, I do think you've got to keep because I just don't see who the alternatives are at that price point. Potentially, you want to take some money out and go for like a Liveramento, but I'm not sure it's worth using a transfer on that. So for me, if I if you own Semedo and Marcel, you keep them. Jimenez is in a similar boat in that I don't think there are many good striking options at the moment. I don't think it's worth the upgrade from Jimenez to Bamford, in my opinion, at the moment. And you've got to then downgrade all the way to the likes of Armstrong or Pookie or Dennis, who, yes, you're getting yourself some funds. That might be a good way to downgrade some of your, your funds out of your attack to then put into your defense, as we've just spoken about. So I quite like that technique. But I don't think it's, again, maybe worth using the free transfer to downgrade Jimenez when he's got Southampton, Newcastle, Villa and Leeds in the next four. Like, I'm not sure that that's worth it for me personally. I think what I would say is that Traore is probably the one that if I was telling someone to remove a Wolves player, Traore would probably the, be the one that I would suggest removing. And again, for me, I would probably be tempted to keep him. But I know, for example, Joe from Fantasy Football Scout, I think is looking to transfer out Traore this week. And I, the reason for that is there are a lot more options that are a lot more like two, two or three week punts before your wildcard that you could go for in midfield. The likes of Ismail Assar, who's got Newcastle next. You could go for Gray, who's got Norwich next. You could go for a long term pick in someone like Conor Gallagher, Ben Rama, Rafinha. There are so many other options that you could go for at that price point who are arguably delivering more than Traore is. So for me, just think about why you brought them in and think about what suddenly changed. If the only reason you've changed your opinion is because they struggled against Brentford, you really shouldn't just let one game week of data put you off. Obviously, they've struggled to perform all season, but you knew that when you brought them in. So again, what's changed in the last week or two? If it's just one performance against Brentford, who are performing pretty well, I'm not sure that would be enough to put me off. But yeah, I would definitely keep Smedo and Marcel, in my opinion. I think Jimenez, there's a lack of alternatives. So you could definitely keep him. Traore, I would probably still keep, but I do understand moving him on because there are so many other options in midfield. I'm not sure if FPL managers are just generally getting more impatient as the season's wearing on, but a lot of the questions were, what do I do with this player? And a lot of people are looking to, I think, feeling quite trigger happy and wanting to take out all of their players but I got a lot of questions what should we do with Torres what should we do with Greenwood what should we do with Jota in my opinion I think you could either sell all of them or you could keep all of them there is reasoning to do both and I think you really need to play to your strengths as an FPL manager if you've read my book the mind game on the psychological aspects of FPL you'll know that a lot of what I say is playing your own game and thinking do you want to be a patient manager do you want to stay keep faith with these players are you more risk seeking do you just want to constantly be making transfers and taking hits you need to really play to your strengths because as I said there are reasons to do both the other thing that I would say will massively influence what my opinion is in this situation is whether you've played 
major wild card and if you haven't when do you car- when do you plan on playing that wild card for example if you plan on playing your wild card in game week 8 or game week 7 or game week 9 i would absolutely sell ferran torres He's got Chelsea and Liverpool in the next two. He's not definitely nailed, especially with the return of Foden, KDB. Both of them could play in the false nine, as could Sterling, as can Gundogan. Like, there's a lot of different things that they could do with that team. So I don't think he's necessarily nailed. And then you can just bring him back in for Burnley, Brighton and Crystal Palace. So if you're going to wildcard in 7, 8, 9, then yes, sell Farron Torres. If you've already wildcarded and you've got Torres in your team, I would probably advise keeping him because you're going to want him for game week 8, 9, 10, even 11, 12, 13, the fixtures aren't that bad moving forward. So from game week eight, you're probably going to want Ferran Torres. So I wouldn't take him out unless you've got your wild card. I just don't think it's worth taking a transfer now to take him out and then using another transfer to bring him back in. So again, Torres in particular is largely dependent on when you've played your wild card or when you plan to. I think Greenwood is probably the biggest risk coming up. I just think with the return of Rashford after the international break, I think with the return of, obviously Cavani will be returning soon. We've got Ronaldo as well now. Um, Sancho as well will start to be embedded into the team properly. Martial, we now know that McTominay's back, so Pogba's more likely to play on the left. You've got Champions League coming up. I just think Greenwood will start to miss a few games now. He's been so, so good so far. In my opinion... It will largely depend on the team that we put out tonight in tonight's game. I'm recording this before the West Ham game. It will largely depend on the team we put out tonight against West Ham. If Greenwood plays in this game and gets sort of 70, 80 minutes, I think there's a relatively strong chance he's benched against Villa. That being said, I still think I still think he will play against Villa. But after that, there's a slight issue. So I think you could hold on to Greenwood this week. He could do something off the bench. He'll probably definitely come off the bench if he is on the bench. So Greenwood, you might be able to give one more week. But I think, yeah, over the next few, you would look to be looking, you would be looking to take Greenwood out. Jota's the same for me, really. I think Jota, you've got to give to Brent, give him the Brentford game. Firmino is making his way back, but I don't think he's ready to start yet. He wasn't involved in the Carabao Cup game. So I don't think Firmino will be ready for the Brentford game. So I think you've got to give Jota Brentford as well. So for me, I think if you're wildcarding soon, Torres is the priority to transfer out just because I can't see much happening against Chelsea and Liverpool. I think Greenwood, you could argue that it's worth taking him out this week, especially with the likes of Saar and Gray with really nice fixtures this week. I'd probably be tempted to keep him for one more week. And Diogo Jota, I think you've got to keep him for one more week. You've got to keep him for that Brentford game. And then you probably take him out in game week seven when you can bring in the likes of Mason Mount Havertz. Or you can potentially just downgrade him to a cheaper option in the likes of Gallagher, etc. So that's my opinion on the three. Again, though, I think if you keep them, that's absolutely fine. If you sell them, that's absolutely fine. Try and play to your strengths as an FPL manager. So the final discussion we've got today is around captaincy. As you know, I normally do this in my team selection video if you've been watching the channel for a while, but I decided to do it in this video instead because a lot of the questions are around captaincy and it also gives me an extra bit of time to just collect all of the data. Again, we're still looking at very small sample sizes, so do take these with a pinch of salt. I think there are some very clear trends and I did tweet about it today, so I'll try and remember to flash it on screen. If I don't, I'll discuss it anyway here. I think it largely depends on what you're looking from from your captain, what you're looking for from your captain. If you're someone that is very interested in underlying statistics from the individual, so how well the individual is performing, Ronaldo has the best underlying statistics here across most of the metrics. Antonio is second in most of the metrics, and then Salah is third. So if you're looking at underlying statistics of the individual, again, it's only been two games that he's been in the Prem, but Ronaldo's underlying statistics are the best here. If you're looking at strength of the team the player plays for, so attacking strength, Liverpool blow United and West Ham out of the water. You can see down below, apart from goals, goals scored, the underlying data is much better for um, for Liverpool. 2.65 non-penalty expected goals per 90. 18 shots in the box per 90 minutes for Liverpool. Like I know a lot of those were in the Leeds game, but 18 shots per 90 is incredible. In the box, sorry, per 90 and four big chances per 90. So Liverpool are the best attacking outfit. So if you're going off of that, Salah is the best captaincy option. And then, and this is as clear as day, you can see by the colour scheme how clear this is. On the right, that's the underlying data for Aston Villa, Leeds and Brentford from a defensive point of view. As you can see, on all four metrics that I've got there, Leeds have the worst defence. On all four metrics, Aston Villa have the second worst defence. And on all three metrics, Brentford have the best defence out of these three. So going off of this, Antonio is the best captaincy option. So if you're going off underlying statistics of the individual, I'd pick Ronaldo. If you're going off underlying statistics of the strength of the of the strength of the team the player plays for from an attacking perspective, you go for Salah because Liverpool are that good. 
if you're going for targeting the opposition and targeting the fixture, I think you've got to target Leeds, especially when you consider the fact that they've got so many injuries. Luke Ayling might not be playing as well. They might barely have a fit defender in their back four. They'll probably have to play Dallas, maybe Phillips at centre-back. So it's a bit all over the place. The only thing that would then make me lean towards Ronaldo, because obviously you've got three equal things there, depending what you give more weighting to, is Manchester United have the only home fixture of the three. And home advantage is definitely coming back. There are more goals scored by home teams in home games. So for that, I would say it probably slightly leans towards Ronaldo. Also, the fact that Tuanzebi isn't available probably would also make me lean towards Ronaldo slightly there. So again, whatever you give more weight to, if you just want to target the fixture, it's got to be Leeds, I think, in my opinion. So you might want to go for Antonio. I think it's very close. At the moment, in my honest opinion, I'm probably just about leaning towards Ronaldo. And then Salah and Antonio are very, very close. But for me, it's very, very equal. And I think if you choose any of these three, I think you've got enough justification to do so. Let's just take a quick look at their heat maps. You know I like to do. So just finally, we don't spend too long on this. I just like to show you I'm very keen on touch maps, heat maps. The reason I am is because I think they're a nice blend between eye test and underlying statistics. Sometimes the statistics can be hard to visualize and sometimes the eye test can fail us. But I think touch maps are a nice combination of the two. As we've spoken about in the past, the more games a player plays and the more touches they have, the more a touch map starts to develop. So for the time being, I don't think they are useful, but they're more useful with larger sample sizes as per all statistics. Salas is so consistent. If you look at back a past, across the last four seasons it's very very similar to this he stays quite wide right but my word he knows how to get into the box and that sort of pocket and the edge of the box inside the box but in the edge he just gets into that so well and you're not sure if he's going to shoot pass cross square it and that's what he's so good at and then Trent obviously overlaps as well so Salah's heat map is always perfect he's always getting so many touches in the box as are Liverpool which then translates into shots in the box as well Ronaldo's is as you would expect there are a lot of touch in the box but as we spoke about in previous videos he is dropping to the left which is his natural tendency we know he played there a lot for Manchester United as well that is where he played and he's a lot a lot in the past in a lot of his uh, matches in his career so he does drift off to the left he is dropping a little bit deeper and Bruno makes those sort of marauding runs forward Greenwood sort of cuts inside so does Sancho or Pogba so he is dropping a little bit deeper than I perhaps expected him to but what is important is when he needs to be in the box he is in there and the, the data does suggest that Manchester United are trying to feed him wherever possible so I think by the end of this season his touch map alongside the likes of Romelu Lukaku will look amazing it is also very similar to Antonio as you can see lots of touches essentially in the box but he likes to drift out to the left so I'm not necessarily saying they're the same sort of player, but they've both got the athleticism to run. But I think a lot of what they do is getting in and around the box, but they also do drop deep, which allows the central midfielders, the likes of Ben Rama or Fernandez, to go and, and roll forward and run into those central areas. So basically, all three of these have amazing underlying statistics. They all have really, really good touch maps. They've all got really good fixtures in their own rights, depending on whether you're looking at the attacking strength or the defensive strength. I really don't know, to be honest. I think you go for whatever your gut feeling is telling you. Perhaps you only own two of them and you've got a 50-50 decision. For me, I own all three and I am really struggling. But at the moment, I'm leaning towards Ronaldo just probably because of the home advantage and just about the underlying statistics for Ronaldo. So guys, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the video today. This one took me a while. This one took me around 10 to 12 hours from start to finish to make the graphics, to do the research, to record, edit, process, etc. So... If you enjoyed it and you're still watching, please do just like, comment and subscribe. I appreciate it so much. It helps the channel to grow. And yeah, it just, I appreciate the support so, so much. It makes putting in all this effort definitely worth it. Also, if you're still watching now, I assume you really do like the videos, in which case you can now join and become a member of the channel. There should be a join button next to the subscribe button. And if not, there is a link in the comments or in the description of the video. It allows you to have some perks such as direct messaging with me on Twitter. We've also got a group chat amongst all of the Raptor channel members, which is really really, really cool as well. So if you do want to support the channel beyond just a like, comment and subscribe, you can become an official member, but no obligations to do so whatsoever. I will catch you in the next video, which will probably be obviously game week seven now. So good luck in game week six. I hope you absolutely smash it and I'll catch you in the next one, guys. Thank you very much. Bye.